This conference will now be recorded. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Abir. I'm a PGO1 Neurology. And today I'm going to be presenting a, a very interesting lecture pertaining to neurocritical care. And it's about localization in comatose patients. So for a start of here, we have um, an unconscious CT head of a 68-year-old gentleman who was presenting with altered level of consciousness leading to coma. And he was found to have bilateral thalamic stroke um, embolic in nature. Now that said, the um, outline of today's presentation will go as the following. So we're gonna go through important definitions and understand through two of the neuroanatomy of uh, structures important in maintaining consciousness. We're gonna go over a list of etiologies that could contribute to altered level of consciousness of variable degrees from mild, moderate, severe to coma. And we're gonna elaborate on important physical um, examination signs uh, that could help us in localizing lesions. And then we're gonna take all of this and then try to understand different clinical presentation pertaining to the underlying causes. We're gonna go over conditions that are in clinical practice, uh, could be misdiagnosed as coma, and I'd like to call them coma mimics. And then lastly, we're gonna go over signs and uh, evaluation of brain death as per the AAM or the American Academy of Neurology. So for us to know what is coma, we need to understand what is consciousness. And consciousness could be a little bit more of an ambiguous concept. So for example, the utilitarian uh, concept, they, they define consciousness as with intact cognition and um, awareness. But for simplicity purposes, we'll define it as a state where the patient is arousable and responsive to himself and environment around. And this is said to be maintained by a structure called the ARES, or the Ascending Reticular Activating System, that facilitates the communication between the brainstem and the cerebral cortex, specifically the frontal cortex. Now, that said, coma, on the contrary, is opposite to that, where the person becomes unresponsible and unaware. unaware. So what happened here is that it, it is under um, a big umbrella term called the uh, disorders of consciousness, where the patient can have coma or a vegetative state or even minimally conscious state. So coma in clinical practice can be assessed uh, using different scoring system. The most commonly used is the Glasgow Coma Scale, and it can further subclassify mild, moderate, severe, or alert, drowsy, um, um, delirious, uh, stuporous, uh, obtunded stuporous and comatose. Now it doesn't have a diagnostic value, but it plays a key role in terms of monitoring patient response in terms of level of consciousness throughout course of the treatment. Now, what is the areas? Now, the reticular activating system was first conceptualized in the mid 20th century by Dr. Marzi Mogan, and they were very interested in sleep and wakefulness. So they did the study on animals, specifically cats, where they would induce a deep state of coma and they would monitor the cortical electrical activity using EEG. Now what they've noticed is that there is a deep sleep pattern despite vigorous sensory stimulation. So the neuroanatomy of the reticular activating system, so for visual purposes here, if you can look at the diagram, so depicted here in red, so the ascending reticular activating system originates from the superior portion of the palm, specifically the pontine reticular formation. And it ascends to the midbrain and behind the right nucleus in the mesencephalic pigmentum. And from there, it goes to your, your infamous relay which we all know about, which is your, your diencephalon, composed of your thalamus and hypothalamus. And from over there, it creates what we call thalamocortical projection, specifically projects into the frontal cortex. And this is how you maintain the communication between the brainstem, the RAS, as well as the frontal cortex. So if you look here in this diagram, uh, shaded in green, this is your reticular activating system. And um, there are so many important structures that run in close proximity to the RAS. So this is important when it comes to localization, and I'm going to go over this as well in the subsequent slides. So an example here would be your MLF or the medial longitudinal fasciculus. Now, it runs in very close proximity to the RAS, communicating your third and the contralateral sixth cranial nerve nuclei to facilitate the horizontal eye movements. Now, if you have a lesion, uh, uh, basically whether it's a bleed, ischemia, or secondary to a transtentorial herniation where it's compressed, it may result into INO, and this could be of a localizing value. So pathophysiology, now for us or for a patient to be maintaining their level of consciousness, you need to have at least an intact RAS with at least one cerebral hemisphere. 
So this is important to keep in the back of your head as we discuss more of the etiologies. So for example, if a patient has mild, for example, trauma to one cerebral hemisphere, it's less likely that they will go to a coma from this insult to, to the one cerebral hemisphere. <clears throat> Excuse me. Or if they have an isolated medullary lesion, it's less likely to cause coma. Now, when we go through the etiologies, um, let's break them down into structural and non-structural causes. Now, non-structural causes, um, they're almost always systemic in nature, and they can be subclassified into either uh, toxins, so commonly carbon monoxide, ethylene glycol, drugs most commonly benzos and tranquilizers. It can happen most common in clinical practice is metabolic, metabolic coma, metabolic encephalopathies, uh, like with hypohypernitremias, <clears throat> hepatic encephalopathy or Wernicke secondary to patient with hyperemesis gravidarum or post-bariatric surgery and uremia. And the list goes on. It can happen post-infection uh, or basically during infections like with meningitis, encephalitis, or meningovascular neurosyphilis or cerebral malaria. It can happen in psychiatric illnesses, and we're going to talk more about that. How can we differentiate psychogenic from, from genuine ones and post ECMO? When it comes to structural, uh, we further subclassify symmetrical versus asymmetrical and also relative to the tentorium, so supertentorial versus infratentorial. And as I've mentioned earlier, that you need to have involvement at least with one of the cerebral hemispheres with the RAS in order to cause altered level of consciousness leading to coma. So the, the conditions could be variable from a bleed, from an ischemic stroke with a significant cytogenic edema, or it could be secondary to um, basically getting here a tumor with a secondary bleed into it. Um, moving onwards here into uh, uh, one interesting actually etiology that could be metabolic in nature but result into structural pathology. And an example here would be hyponatremia. Now, rapid correction of hyponatremia may result into what we call central pontine myelinolysis, which is the osmotic demyelination. And this could result into a lesion in the brainstem. It has a characteristic feature um, basically on MRI, specifically to T2 and flare. Uh, and because of the demyelination, it creates what we call the piglet face sign. Now when it comes to assessing a patient with an altered level of consciousness, obviously we'd like to know more of the story about the patient. Uh, if we have a paramedic, a family member, a friend that was with the patient before they become obtunded or stuporous or comatose, it would be helpful to know how were they basically before they became obtunded. Do they have any specific medical condition, uh, like for example liver disease? Are they on a long-term steroid and they forgot to take, for example, one dose, or they are sick and forgot to take double dose? Uh, are these patients suffering from pituitary tumors and they are enlarging and they are presenting to us, for example, with secondary adrenal insufficiency uh, due to pituitary apoplexy? And uh, knowing patient medication, their psychiatric history, all these stuff are quite important. Now, if we don't have them, we do heavily depend on our physical examination, our labs, and basically insulin. So it's important to start our physical exam, assessing the patient vitals. It could give us a clue. So the patient was hypertensive, it may be secondary to press syndrome, hypertensive encephalopathy. The patient is pregnant, maybe this is eclampsia or preeclampsia. Patient might be hypotensive and it could be septic in nature or because of endocrine emergencies like adrenal insufficiencies uh, or basically uh, um, in other conditions. Now, when it comes to assessing a patient from a neurological uh, point of view, it is different in the sense that patient is not cooperative. So we start with level of consciousness, we go through the brainstem reflexes, and we do assess the motor in terms of tone, uh, the patient, the deep tendon reflexes, and the responses to pain. Now, the level of consciousness in a patient who is comatose, we almost always do it in a graded stimuli manner. So when you go into the room, you do call the patient by their name. If they don't respond, you raise your voice. And this is basically help you to differentiate get some mimics, like for example, patient with locked in syndrome secondary to basilar's, basilar artery stroke, you will have intact eye movement, blinking. And this is how can you differentiate between, for example, um, a genuine patient who's in a coma versus a mimic secondary to basilar artery stroke. Now, Signs of localizing value in coma. So we're going to go over different respiratory pattern and then brainstem reflexes, as I've mentioned, and then motor assessment. So when it comes to the respiratory pattern, um, it's quite interesting. So if you look here in this diagram, uh, and I'm going to describe them 
uh, relative to their anatomical location of lesions, so in a rostrocodal manner, so from top to bottom. So you might have a patient with a bihemispheric dysfunction, and they might not have any respiratory compromise in the sense they're able still to maintain their airways, but they might have a very subtle signs, like for example, deep yawns and signs. Now, let's go to our different types of respiratory patterns. So this is per se is not really a respiratory pattern, but I place it here as a comparison to the other patterns that I'm going to explain. So post hyperventilation apnea, as the name implies, is the apnea that happens after hyperventilation. It almost always basically indicates that the patient has a bilateral hemispheric dysfunction. And this phenomenon, how do we elicit it? By asking the patient to take five deep breaths, and this will wash out carbon dioxide, you will measure the PCO2 and notice there's a drop at least by 10 millimeters of mercury. Now, followed by that there will be an apneic episode, and usually it will be less than 10 seconds. And it's around the time where the brain, the core brain structures, will detect the rise in CO2 and hence stimulate a rhythmic respiratory pattern. Now, in a patient with a four brain structure being destroyed or damaged or dysfunctional for whatever reason, this results into an apneic pause that is longer, 20 to 30 seconds. And this happens because the threshold of detecting PCO2 becomes higher. Now, as we go more codely or itself, shine sucks breathing. It's, it's a very well-known kind of respiratory, respiration pattern in patients with altered level of consciousness. And it can happen because of structural, metabolic cause, or even it can happen as a sequelae in a patient who is herniating secondary to a supertentorial mass with a mass effect. So Shane Stock's respiration is characterized with what we call a crescendo de crescendo respiratory pattern. It means the patient will have breaths that are shallow, becomes deeper, deeper, and then they exhale in the same manner, and they will go into apnea or hypoapneic episode. Shane Stock's respiration are regular in nature, and they could be secondary to a bihemispheric, a bithalamic dysfunction. They could be secondary to metabolic condition like uremia, uh, anoxia or in heart failure, but also bear in mind there could be a normal variant in patients living in high altitudes. And uh, as I've mentioned, it can happen secondary to transtentorial herniation as a sequelae and um, part of Cushing triad, if you will. And I'll go over it as well in the clinical presentation section. Now, Let's say if this patient is having a supertentorial mass and they're going really from Shane Stock's respiration. Now your midbrain is being affected and the patient is going into what we call a sustained hyperventilation um, pattern. So sustained hyperventilation happens when there is involvement of the midbrain, a uh, most common midbrain or superior pulse. And commonly here, uh, one, of, uh, one of the etiologies is a brainstem tumor or an astrocytoma or secondary to an ischemic or hemorrhagic insult. So the mechanism behind it is that, let's say as an example, is a tumor. Uh, a tumor is what would happen is that it creates an acidic environment in the surrounding CSF. And this will be picked up by the sensory uh, receptors and stimulate your respiratory pattern to cause hyperventilation. By that, it will wash out carbon dioxide to balance out the acidic environment. So this is one of the proposed mechanisms why a patient would go into a hyperventilation and it's a very, um, very basically insufficient breathing pattern. Now as the lateral segmentum of the, of the lower half of the pole is being involved, the patient can go into what we call apnoistic breathing. Now if you look here, apnoistic breathing is characterized what we call a lung inspiratory pose. So the patient will take a deep breath in, there will be a plateau because they are holding the breath, exhale obviously involuntarily and the exhalation is very inadequate very short and will have a poses in between so for demonstration purposes the patient would breathe like this this is apnoistic breathing so as the lesions start to involve for example more more uh, more caudal structures so now lower pons high medulla patient may start to develop what we call cluster breathing and cluster breathing is quite chaotic very irregular but not as irregular as, for example, ataxic breathing that I'll talk about in a moment. In cluster breathing, this is how you would, you would see it. It looks like Shane Stock's breathing, but it's much shorter and much irregular. And this could be a breathing pattern patient uh, pending to go into an ataxic breathing. Now, ataxic breathing. Ataxic breathing, also uh, known as called the atrial fibrillation of respiration. And what happens here, the patient has very irregular breaths, and in between the apneic poses, they may have inspiratory gasps. 
Now, this is an ominous sign and seen in agonal patients and almost always indicate a respiratory failure. And it indicates there is a dorsal a dorsal dysfunction of the dorsal medial aspect of the medulla. Now, it can happen from cerebellar hemorrhages or pontine hemorrhages. It can happen as a sequelae of coning secondary to supertentorial mass and a transtentorial herniation. But also, it has been actually described in patients with severe meningitis. Now, Undine's curse per se is not a respiration pattern, but it's a phenomenon. And Undine's curse was initially actually described in patients with central hypoventilation syndrome. Now, central hypoventilation syndrome uh, was uh, can be further congenital or acquired. The one I'm denoting toward here is the acquired one. It happens post, uh, for example, infarction or trauma. Now, what happens here, the patient literally forgets to, to breathe at night, and it's the loss of automatic breathing during sleep. And this is set to, set to happen secondary to brainstem dysfunction, whether medullary tegmental infarcts, lower brain brainstem dysfunction, and even it can be iatrogenic. Now, iatrogenic post um, pain relief surgeries like ventrilateral uh, section in the spinal cord uh, per se and is set to, to interfere with the reticulospinal tract. So this is our respiratory pattern from top to bottom, from rose to the coronal manner, and how it manifests. Keep them at the back of your head because we're going to go over them. Uh, in the clinical presentation. So it's almost important to keep this hand in hand with an ABG to know what is the patient baseline uh, acidic or basic environment. Temperature, uh, if you remember earlier, we do look at the vitals and patients who is hyperthermic, it could be either secondary to sepsis, which almost always has to be ruled out, or it could be central in cause. Central causes can happen because of hypothalamic dysfunction, it can happen from pontine tegmental lesion, but also can be seen in patients with traumatic brain injuries that they may go into what we call paroxysmal sympathetic hyperactivity. They will develop episodes of, of high fever, tachycardia, or sympathetic overflow technically. Moving onwards to pupils. Now, now we're going through the brainstem, brainstem reflexes. Now, pupillary changes also, I'm going to explain them in a, a rostrocodal manner in terms of the location of the lesion. So, bihemispheric dysfunction may not cause any specific obvious pupillary changes. The pupils will be as small, <clears throat> they're round, symmetrical, but they're still reactive to light, and we call them diencephalic pupils. As you go more down to involve the midbrain, you might have a tectal or pretectal lesion versus a tegmental lesion. A pretectal or tectal lesion is said to cause, it could be symmetrical or asymmetrical, a mid sized pupil. The pupil are poorly reactive to light, if not at all, and they may develop what we call hippus, or it's a spontaneous contraction of the iris. And now this cannot be, <clears throat> so sometimes it cannot be picked up by the naked eye, you need a magnification, so you might use the head of the otoscope to see it. Now, an interesting here in a tectal or pretectal lesion, patient may have what we call a positive ciliospinal reflex. Now, ciliospinal reflex has another name that is called, called a cutaneous pupillary reflex. It's by pinching the side of the skin and the neck, uh, or for example, scratching it, this will stimulate an ipsilateral pupillary dilatation, one or two millimeters. And this happens because of the stimulation of the, uh, of the efferent sympathetic pathway in the cervical region. A tegmental lesion, a much more lower in comparison to the pretectal, it results as well the same thing, the, mid, the, 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 the pupils are dilated, poorly reactive to light, but they may result into an asymmetrical contraction of the iris. And that causes what we call a midbrain correctopia. Or as you can see, it looks like the, the pupil has been pulled to one side. And how can we differentiate between tegmental and tectal or pretectal is that the ciliospinal reflex is absent in the tegmental lesion. Now, make sure the patient is, doesn't have any other causes that may suppress the ciliospinal reflex, like, for example, propofol, or patients with Horner syndrome, they may have absent ciliospinal reflex. Going down to a pontine lesion, and we all understand, we know that, uh, or before we go to the pontine lesions, let's say here we have a patient with a, a subdural hematoma expanding. Now they're going into a lateral herniation of their uncus, or there's an uncle herniation through the tentorium, and it's compressing the third cranial nerve here. This will result into an ipsilateral third cranial nerve palsy, so the pupils will be dilated and not reactive to light. And we call them the Hutchinson's pupils. 
Now going down <clears throat> to involve the poems. Now going involving the poems, uh, this definitely your interferes or your sympathetic pathway. And this results into unopposed parasympathetic and small pinpoint pupils that are not reactive to light. Now it's important to monitor your patient in terms of their pupillary uh, responses, but not necessarily seeing a patient upon basic ligand for them, for example, presenting with altered level of consciousness, a dilated pupil poorly reactive to light does not imply a poor prognosis. They did a series um, of studies, um, and basically there is a series of 40 patients that have had a fixed dilated pupils upon assessment, 25% made recovery. But as far as I know, the assessment of a pupil 72 hours from the onset of altered level of consciousness has a prognostic value, as opposed to 24 hours or upon the patient presenting. Now moving onwards to the eye movements. Now we're testing here the third, third fourth, and sixth cranial nerves. Now, again, I'm going to be explaining eye movements in the same fashion in a roster codal manner. And uh, it's interesting because it can give you a lot of information regards the location of the lesion. But with eye movements, we're assessing the basically the movement of the patient's eyes, whether it's spontaneous or we're using certain maneuvers in order to aid in location. So for example, uh, uh, when I'm explaining them, I will also denote towards the vor or the vestibular ocular reflex or the oculocephalic or the doll's eye, whatever you would like to call it, as well the, the water colorant testing. So just to refresh in our minds, the oculocephalic or the vestibular ocular reflex is basically assessing uh, um, the, the integrity of the midbrain and the pons because really it, it's the connection between the third, the fourth, and the sixth cranial nerve nuclei uh, when moving the head either in a horizontal pattern or in a vertical pattern. So in a patient, uh, let's say an awake person like me and you, doing the oculocephalic reflex, the eye usually stays with the head and it doesn't have really that much clinical significance. In a patient who is brain dead, the eye also will remain with the head. In a brain stem dead, your brain, your midbrain and palms are not functional, and hence your vor becomes negative dull's eye phenomena. On the contrary, a patient who have an intact midbrain or palms, their oculocephalic reflex will be intact or it will be positive, in the sense that if you move a patient's head, for example, from the right side to the left side in a horizontal panel, the eye will get lag and then catch up. And then on the contralateral side, it will lag and then catch up, and is basically a positive dull eye. Now, that said, let's talk about the lesions. Now, you might have a hemispheric lesion, and, and as an example here, it's on the right. The patient might have what we call a conjugate gaze. So the conjugate gaze is when both eyes looking in the same direction. And a patient with a lesion in the cerebral hemisphere on the right side, for example, they will have a forced gaze deviation to the right. And you can easily overcome it, overcome it with a dull's eye phenomena, a dull's eye reflex, or the uh, water caloric testing. On the contrary, having a subcortical lesion like in the thalamus or in, in your basal ganglia, the eye will look in the contralateral side, and we call it the wrong eye sign. So you have the lesion on the left, the patient is looking to the right, so wrong eye sign. And still it can be overcome because your midbrain pawns are intact. Now going to a lesion involving the tectum, so let's say the patient is having an onco herniation, there is a compression of the quadrigeminal cistern, for example, and there is impingement on the, on the pretectal plate. Now, or the tectal plate secondary to a tumor, for example. What happened here is that you're impairing the vertical gaze, so the patient may go to what's called vertical palsy. Now, not only that, if you look here at the eyes, you'll notice there is a vertical gaze, the patient is unable to look upwards, and this is what we call a sunset sign. In fact, <clears throat> it can be part of what we call Parinote syndrome or Perinote syndrome. And uh, obviously this is courtesy to Dr. Henri Perinot, uh, where he described basically in here this, what we call the, the dorsal midbrain syndrome. So the patient will have impaired vertical gaze, you will have a conversion to retraction and stagnance. And in a cooperative patient, you might actually even elicit what we call the light near dissociation. You can still overcome it with the oculocephalic reflex, though. So the brain goes down more to involve the tegmentum of the brain. And basically, again, here, uh, that will now hear your effect. The eye movements are pretty much distorted, as you can see here, they're opposite direction. And you have impaired bore or those eye reflex. Involvement of the third cranial nerve, for example, the same same example would be onco herniation. You might have 
a, a full-on third corneal palsy or partial one, where you have ptosis, then you have the pupils are dilated, and they're being pulled out and out, uh, in and uh, sorry, out and, and down by the lateral rectus and superior oblique. And you cannot overcome it by the oculocephalic, the eye will, will not move because of impaired medial rectus. Now, you might have, if you remember earlier on, in a very close proximity here is your medial longitudinal fasciculus facilitating the communication between your third contralateral six and the parapontine reticular formation. Now, in a patient with a right medial longitudinal fasciculus, you will have ophthalmoplegia of the same eye, so right eye and O, right internuclear ophthalmoplegia. <clears throat> Sorry. So what happens here is that you're going to have impaired adductions, adduction of the right eye in this example, and you have a normal abduction of the of the contralateral side, and you might notice a nystagmoid dirx in the contralateral eye. So if we have a patient here with a right eye and O, because of MLF is being involved, <clears throat> upon moving the head to the contralateral side, you will have impaired adduction of the right and a normal uh, abduction of the contralateral eyes. And you can use right ML I know with the right ophthalmoplegia. Now, as you have a lesion much more down in the palms, you may develop what we call pontine gaze palsy. And a pontine gaze palsy characterized that you um, you have what we call um, the eye will be looking to the hemispheric side. So what does that mean? So the patient might have a left lower palms lesion, and the the eyes will be looking to the other side. So we'll be looking to the hemispheric side. And you can see that the patient is having a left lower pons lesion in the tegmentum, and the eyes is looking towards the right hemisphere. And because here at this stage, um, basically in the pons, your uh, uh, the oculocephalic reflex will be negative. So you will not be able to elicit anything. All right, so you might have eyes looking in complete opposite direction. We call it dis disconjugate gaze. Now, disconjugate gaze can happen because of isolated failure of ocular adduction, or it can happen because of MLF relieving to eye and eye. Now, you might have a, a basically, again, your immediate longitudinal fasciculus secondary to structural cause. And this is basically our, our um, innate uh, thinking that MLF probably secondary to a lesion causing eye and eye. But bear in mind, keep an open mind, that there are certain metabolic conditions that may result into MLF and they tend to be transient. So how can we differentiate? We can differentiate between medial longitudinal fasciculus leading to internuclear ophthalmoplegia, secondary to a metabolic cause as opposed to structural, is by causing or by doing a vigorous water caloric testing. So if you set the patient at 30 degrees and still at zero degrees cold water into one of, one of the ears, let's say the right ear, you will notice that the eye will move towards the right eye. And if you can overcome a medial longitudinal fasciculus with a vigorous water caloric testing, this is most likely MLF secondary to a metabolic cause as opposed to, um, as opposed to structural. Moving onwards to corneal reflex, and it tends to be one of the one of the reflexes that tend to have a very high threshold to be lost in brainstem dysfunction or brainstem um, disease. So it can happen if you have an effect of the, of the afferent or the efferent pathway of the corneal reflex. Uh, and the way we do it, we do assess the corneal reflex, specifically the, um, the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve. Now, you could also assess it, in, assess it in different ways by doing a nose tickle or by brushing over the patient's eyelashes. It does the same, it does the same thing. So you're assessing afferent and efferent. So if any of the afferents or efferent affected, you'll have an impaired corneal reflex. So you have to look for symmetry and if it's asymmetrical. Just a gentle reminder, corneal reflex has to be done by an aseptic technique uh, because you're dealing with, with patients who, who, um, who are comatose or have, for example, cannot blink. Now, moving onwards to eye uh, movements. Now, spontaneous eye movements, I'm not going to go over them all in details, but I'm going to try to get a video because it's better to learn of eye movements, spontaneous eye movements visually as opposed to reading about them. So spontaneous eye movements, some of the common eye movements that are seen in, in, the, in practice. So commonly here we call the ping pong gaze. And this can happen if you look at the patients, let's say for example comatose, their eye will be roving right and left, right and left. And this can happen in bihemispheric dysfunction. Ocular bobbing is another one in a patient with a pontine lesion. So you'll notice the eye is going downwards, like has a fast phase, looks like a jerk, but it's not. And then basically goes back to baseline, the mid, mid kind of position, and then goes down and then back to mid position. 
and then there is there's a whole list of it. Now moving on over to the motor exam. Now motor exam in a comatose patient, we do assess tone um, and we assess um, basically again her reflexes and some of the responses to pain. So in a live coma, a tone still is maintained in the sense that when you lift it, it will go down slowly in a resting position. As opposed to a patient who has had, for example, an insult in an acute phase, <clears throat> where there, there is paralysis or there's a paritic limb that is not spastic, the hand will go down like it's a dead weight. So it will really drop down like it's a dead weight. Now, moving on is into, um, uh, if a patient has had a coma secondary to anoxia, post cardiac arrest, uh, they may develop, uh, basically again here, cerebral hyperperfusion affecting the watershed areas or specifically cerebral border zones. So this will have propensity to affect your anterolateral sides. And this may result into, um, if you'd remember the homunculus or the topographic representation of our body on the cerebral cortex, this will affect our upper limb in comparison to the lower limb. And that may result in what we call paralysis or weakness of the upper limb more than the lower limb, and we call it man in a barrel syndrome. Now it's a localizing, uh, it's a localizing uh, kind of um, basically finding, but you have to understand what has caused this in the first place, especially if it's bilateral. Bilateral doesn't go with, with more likely stroke, that there's something more systemic. Now, response to pain. Um, so these two different posturing we, we are very familiar with. Uh, when a patient goes in a decorticate or decerebrate posturing secondary to a painful stimuli. So what's the difference between them? So common is, the common things between them, the patient is having a deduction of the arms, they're having flexion of the wrists, extension of the knees, plantar flexion at the ankles. The difference in a decorticate patient will have flexion at the elbows, and a decerebrate they will have extension and pronation of the elbows. Now, decorticate posturing can be seen in patients with metabolic coma, with bihemispheric dysfunctions. It can be seen even in midbrain and midbrain involvements. As the lesion becomes more, more codal, for example, involving the pons, patient may go from, from a decorticate to a decerebrate, and, and we're gonna go over this in the cortical presentation section. Now, involvement of the medulla, let's say we're talking about patients with a central transtentorial herniation that was not, for example, operated on, and they went on cooning, they may go through the sequelae of decorticate, decerebrate, and then they completely become flaccid. And loss basically can become flaccid, it could be a sign involvement of the medulla, it's an omnias sign. Now, Facility in critical care, I'm not going to go into, into details about it because I, I believe this is a topic on its own. Um, but polyneuropathy is explained and, and described in patients with, with critical illness, and it can happen two to five days actually after onset of altered level of consciousness, and it can go on to manifest lung treatment. Usually they are detected by nerve conduction or EMGs, where you would have a decrease in uh, the sensory neuron action potential or what we call the conduction uh, muscle action potential and certain basically uh, nerve conduction uh, features. Patient may develop severe necrosis uh, basically of the muscles, specifically secondary to steroid, which could have the tendency to be used in, in um, more in neuro ICU or MICU. Now that said, so we have now here a mix of, of many things that we've discussed. So we've discussed basically different respiratory pattern, brainstem reflexes, certain motor movements, and basically responses to pain. So let's just take all of this together into clinical presentation. So in a patient with metabolic encephalopathy, um, our brain basically thinks that there should not be any localizing sign because it's metabolic in nature. However, you have to keep an open mind that there are certain conditions where the patient may develop localizing signs uh, despite that their etiology is metabolic in nature. So, for example, in a patient with hepatic encephalopathy, they may have downward deviation of the eyes. And in patients, for example, with ethylene glycol toxicity or exposure at some point, they may result into focal brain lesions. And it depends where the lesion may result in a neurological deficit with a localizing sign. Now, it depends on the underlying etiologies. The patient may have seizures. <clears throat> and we're going to come talk more about this in, in a moment in actually the mimics. Uh, they may have asterixis in early stages of hepatic encephalopathy, myoclonus that may be noticed in a patient with Crispal-Jacob disease or CGD. 
Um, or, for example, patients may have other localizing signs, um, like, for example, in, in patients with NMDA. Now, moving on into clinical presentations in patients that may have a supra or infratensorial lesions. Now, before we go into this, let's just remind ourselves with the, with the infamous, what we call the Monroe Kelly Doctrine. So, Monroe Kelly Doctrine, they discussed that the skull itself is a closed compartment, right, and has a fixed volume of 1,400, 1,700 mils, composed of 80% brain, parenchyma, 10% CSF, 10% blood. So this is always maintained in a balance. And if there is any disruption in one of them, one of them has to be displaced in order to maintain this. Because the skull is a closed in an adult, it's a closed basically again here, it's like a closed compartment. So the pressure will be displaced either, it's a supertentorial will be displaced through the tentorium, or it could be basically further displaced through the foramen magnum. So you might have a supertentorial lesion where they're basically it's, um, the patient is having a bleed, a subdural bleed, intraparenchymal bleed. It could be basically a tumor that is growing or a tumor that has had a secondary bleed into it. Or it could be metabolic in nature. So for example, a diffuse bilateral cerebral edema or post-traumatic brain injury, whatever is the cause that is supratentorial. Now, this may result into back pressure and the mass effect could result into herniation. So we can further subclassify supratentorial or basically herniation into lateral versus central. It depends on the direction of the mass effect. So let's go through this. Now, if anyone is interested and would like basically again here to, uh, to answer, maybe if we don't have enough time, I'll go over it. So we have here different types of brain herniation. <clears throat> so we have extracranial herniation, we have what we call the cephalocyte herniation, we have the central descending transtentorial, and we have the lateral descending transtentorial and the tonsillar herniation. In certain conditions where you have an infratentorial lesion, in fact, you could have a pressure high enough to cause ascending transtentorial herniation. Now let's talk about, obviously, by taking the clinical or the cycle in, in, in practice, the most common type of brain herniation is called the subpalacin herniation, or we call the cingulate gyrus herniation. So what happens here, you have here uh, an epidural hematoma. <clears throat> what happens is that the, you will have a hernia of the cingulate gyrus below the falx anteriorly, and hence it's called subpalacin, so below the falx. And usually happen anterior as opposed to posterior because of the falx cerebri. It's less rigid and it's softer in the anterior as opposed to posterior aspect. Now, many, many structures can be affected when it comes to subphalocin and herniation. And this basically again here could tell you on the clinical presentation of the patient. So if we'd refresh our minds there with the medial circulation of the brain. So here we have the anterior cerebral artery. And then you have what we call the callosum marginal artery, which is the nine. And the 10 is the pericolosal artery. And the pericolosal branch of the ACA is the one that tends to be compressed by the uh, subphalocin herniation of the cingulate gyrus um, because of its very close proximity to the corpus callosum. So what would be a clinical presentation by compressing 10 or the pericolosal artery? It's technically a patient may develop anterior cerebral artery syndrome uh, with, uh, with more involvement of the lower limb or weakness of the lower limb and the full arm picture. Now, prognosis when it comes to subphalocin herniation depends on the midline shape. So if you draw a line here, an AP line, and you do measure the distance between the septum pellucidum and basically um, the line that you have drawn, a good prognosis of the shift is less than five millimeter and a poor prognosis of the shift more than 15 millimeter. And usually a neurosurgical intervention will take place with a shift less than five uh, as a protective measure even sometimes. The second most common type of brain herniation is a descending transtentorial herniation, whether it's lateral or central. And it can happen secondary to any cause that could result into a supertentorial, for example, a raise in the pressure with a mass effect. Now, let's talk about different types of herniation pertaining to their location. So I'm gonna start with lateral herniation, and then we're gonna go over central herniation as well. In a lateral herniation, it can be further subclassified into anterior and posterior lateral descending and uh, transtentorial herniation. So the most common one that we see in clinical practice actually is the anterior lateral 
descending transdentural herniation, which is the uncle herniation. So if you take care for an example, you have a right expanding subdural hematoma. It's pushing the brain parenchyma to the contralateral side. You're having a midline shift. You might experience a subphallus and herniation over here. This may compress over here your foramen of Monroe, and the patient may develop hydrocephalus, or you might notice a temporal uh, uh, part of the lateral ventricle gets enlarged. Now, onchus may be pushed downwards through the tentorium, right anteriorly, and it can compress the third cranial nerve, if you remember, can give you your third cranial nerve palsy on the same side. Now, by pushing, okay, by pushing the midbrain to the contralateral side, it's pushing it, it's pushing a soft, soft basically brain parenchyma, which is the midbrain, again a hard, tough, uh, basically again here the tentorial, uh, creating what we call uh, what we call basically Kernahan notch. Now, Kernahan is, is the, the doctor uh, who basically uh, described the, the, the pathophysiology of brainstem, actually this phenomenon as well. I'm going to tell you more about it now. So, by the uncle herniation, compressing third cranial nerve, pushing the midbrain to the contralateral side, again is a rigid, uh, uh, basically uh, the, the, um, the tentorium. It can compress many structures in the stru in this side, and it's, one of them is the pyramidal tract. Now, the pyramidal tract can run the side, and we know pyramidal tract control uh, basically your, the, the motor voluntary movement on the one side of the body, and it will move into weakness on the contralateral side if the lesion is actually before the pyramidal fixation. And this, in this case, the patient will have weakness on the right side. So the bleed is on the right, ipsilateral cranial nerve uh, involvement of the third uh, palsy, and the patient will have weakness on the right. Now, how does that happen? Now, let's go over that. So patient, uh, so just to refresh your mind, the cortical bulbar and corticospinal tract forms your pyramidal tract responsible for controlling your voluntary movement on the contralateral side of the body. So face and arm and body and, and lower limb. So your pyramidal tract on the left side, going down before the fixation and has a control. If you have a lesion, okay, you have a direct lesion now here in the left pyramidal tract, it will, the lesion before the pyramidal decussation will cause weakness on the contralateral side. Now, Dr. Kernahan actually did not explain, explain another phenomenon, which is interesting. So in this case, you're having a left expanding subdural hematoma. The bacteria in green is your oncus, it's herniated down the tentorium, pushing the midbrain to the contralateral side. And this is basically compressing your contralateral pyramidal tract. Your contralateral pyramidal tract is opposite to your bleed, and hence, by doing this, it will cause weakness on the right side. So it creates what we call a false localizing sign. It looks like the patient is having a having a lesion on the other side, but it's not. It's just because of the pyramidal tract on the contralateral side, contralateral to the bleed, is being affected. So this is basically again here the lateral. The, the lateral descending transtentorial herniation explaining Kernahan notch phenomena and the false localizing sign of having the weakness on the same side of the blade. Now, if you don't do much of the patient is not intervening and this basically continues to progress in terms of the descending transtentorial herniation, you might have actually further damage. And, and um, I'll show you that in a moment in the radiological evidence. So, earliest sign. An earliest finding in a patient with, with uh, an uncle herniation would be effacement of the supercellular sister. So what is a supercellular sister? It's, a, it's basically again here depicted in a star shape, so a six-edged star shape, uh, as you can see here. Now, it's important to look for what we call basically is the shining star or the supercellular sister in every CT head of a patient. It should be there if it's normal, uh, if there is no herniation. <clears throat> In this case, you're having um, an uncle or a temporal tumor, and it's causing a mass effect. There is uncle herniation, and this is compressing on your crural, crural sister. So over here, crural sister, here in the perimesencephalic, and here in between is the quadrigeminal sister. And obviously here between the two colliculi, you're having inter, sorry, between the peduncles, you're having interpeduncular sister. Now, an interesting thing in an anterior, which is the uncle herniation lateral, the semi-transcentorial herniation, your oncus is compressing on the crural cistern, and this can actually cause disruption of the other cistern and an axial rotation of the brainstem. 
Now, axial rotation of the brainstem will compress your, your cerebral equinoc to a sylvius, connecting third and fourth ventricles, as well basically can compress your quadrigeminal cistern. Now, in, in a young infant or a child, this may result into hydrocephalus, but also in, in an adult patient who has their head, skull basically is, is technically fused, the, the sutures, the patient may go on and develop a raised intracranial pressure and, and, and herniation. Now, the effacement of the quadrigeminal cistern may have an effect on your pretensile plate and may result into dorsal midbrain syndrome, or what we call the Parinot syndrome. So we have some setting sign, uh, impaired vertical gaze, you're having a contraction, conversion, and stagnus, and um, you might even pick up a light neuro dissociation. Remember earlier when I said if this continues basically to progress and the patient is not treated adequately, Compression on, and basically pressure on the perforating vessels, the perimedium vessels supplying your, your membrane and pulmus, can go on and rupture, and bleeds can happen. Now, small bleeds, either small multiple or large bleed, and we call them the durette or the durette hemorrhages. Now, durette hemorrhages they can be basically, again, here a single, it can be multiple, and usually they indicate a very bad sign, uh, sometimes even irreversible neurological dysfunctions. So this is basically just to summarize, our uncle syndrome can be either early or late. It depends at what stage or what structure are being involved. So here they may have just um, regular breaths or basically um, what we've mentioned, basically the, the uh, what we've mentioned earlier, the post hyperventilation apneas may happen. The pupils may still be intact, but as you go onwards, the third current nerve is being involved patient may go into chain stocks respiration. If your midbrain is involved, you may develop hyperventilation. Um, a full-on third corner palsy may happen ipsilateral to the blade or ipsilateral to the pathology. And um, as you were seeing here, it will have a negative dull's eye or negative vor. And they may go on to develop what we call Kernahan's phenomena because of the involvement of the contralateral parental tract. Now, <clears throat> Going towards the end of our presentation, uh, dealing with a central herniation, it is different in the sense that the mass effect, the direction is different. So you might have, a, for example, a pathology in the temporal lobe, frontal lobe, or parietal lobe in comparison to an uncle herniation where you have the mass is more on the lateral side, and this can result into central transitorial herniation. Not necessarily a structural lesion, so example here, this is a CT and MRI of actually a young patient who has had a central transit descending transitorial herniation secondary to cerebral edema that had happened secondary to a treatment, a vigorous treatment actually of diabetic ketoacidosis. So looking at the diagram here. So you have a tumor. Let's say the tumor has been growing for a while, or the tumor has had a secondary bleed and the patient presented acutely, <clears throat> has caused or has a mass effect. Now, this mass effect will cause flattening of the midbrain and the pulmons in a top-to-bottom fashion or rostrocodal fashion, causing elongation. Now, this elongation has a pressure, it has, has a stretching effect on these blood vessels, specifically the paramedium. may result into these small bleeds that I've mentioned earlier, the durette or the durette bleeds, and the tegmentum in the midbrain. So you can start in the midbrain and you can involve the pulmons later on. So central herniation has five stages. Not necessarily patients will go over them and you'll see them. Sometimes they will be subtle, sometimes they will be too fast. It depends on how acute is the underlying challenge. So in the first two stages of the early and the late diencephalic stage, you can still do something and have an irreversible, ah, sorry, have a reversible neurological deficit. So in an early diencephalic stage, patients may still have intact, um, basically respiratory pattern, they may have deep yawns or sighs, and they are very subtle signs. The patient uh, uh, may go onward to have per peritoneum, you have grasp reflexes, they may have a positive Babinski bilaterally, or it depends on the cause. As patient manifests into what we call late diencephalic stage, now at this stage they are unarousable, unresponsive, they are in coma. They may develop a chain stocks respiration, now, it depends on the pupils. They may be diencephalic pupils. They're just small, symmetrical reactive to lights. Um, water eye, sorry, the dull's eye phenomena or the water caloric are still intact because the midbrain and pulse are still intact. And as the lesion basically again here goes down to involve the midbrain and the upper pulse, it becomes much more obvious. 
Now, with brain of proponents, patient may start having uh, basically different respiratory patterns. So they may develop apneustic, not apneustic breathing, actually, they may develop uh, hyperventilation. Uh, they, they may develop uh, oscillation in their temperature. Even basically uh, stretching on the hypothalamus may cause diabetes and so this, and this may result actually into hypernitremia. Pupils mid size, they may have hippus, they may have the midbrain corotopia, the one I've showed you in the tegmentum of the midbrain, and they may develop decorticate or decerebrate posture. So the lesions start to involve the pulse. Now, patient goes into apnoistic breathing. You remember the breathing pattern of so they're having inspiratory poses. And the pupils can, uh, at this stage here, become small, pinpoint, not reactive to light because of your sympathetic pathways. It can go from a decorticate to a decerebrate posture. The medullary stage is almost always irreversible. A uh, patient can go in a complete facility. They become agonal. Ataxic breathing goes on. They are in respiratory, complete respiratory failure. Um, and everything really goes haywire. This is just a diagram <clears throat> that you can go over. It summarizes the stages um, of central transtentorial herniation. Now, lastly, in the clinical presentation section, we're having a, a, sub a subtentorial structural lesion. And, and for example, something very common in clinical practice is cerebellar bleed and hypertensive patient, or it could be a tumor with a secondary bleed. Now, because of the posterior plus is very small, um, it doesn't take time for the patient to manifest quite fast. And because of its close proximity to the brainstem, sometimes all the structures of the brainstem can be affected at one go. So when it comes to the brainstem, or sorry, infratentorian, uh, uh, basically structural lesions, they can have very subtle signs. They can cause descending. They can actually cause coning straight away. Or <clears throat> in some occasions, they may cause what we call an ascending transtentorial herniation. So you're having your acidotoxic edema, uh, let's say secondary to a stroke, as in this case, what will happen here is the patient may develop what we call an ascending transtentorial herniation of the midbrain structures as well as the superior cerebellar lobule. Now, a very subtle sign and a very early sign actually is what we call compression of the quadrigeminal cistern. And <clears throat> I showed you that earlier. If you'd remember here, so this is your quadrigeminal cistern, and it can be effaced, it can be basically then here. Uh, can be uh, a face compressed by an ascending transtentorial herniation, and this is one of the earliest signs in uh, ascending transtentorial herniation. <clears throat> so, patient may go into a midbrain dysfunction, they may develop coma, as we've mentioned, hyperventilation, pupils are fixed, uh, uh, the, the pretectal uh, te tectal plate is involved, they may develop perinode syndrome or dorsal midbrain with impaired vertical, uh, vertical gaze. Now, that's it for the clinical presentation section. Now, <clears throat> some conditions in clinical practice are misdiagnosed as coma, and uh, some example, for example, would be a non-convulsive status epilepticus. You might pick it up in clinical examination. You're examining patient, you might notice the stagmas, and you have to almost rule it out by doing an EEG. Other conditions like basilar stroke leading to a locked-in syndrome. Now, in locked-in syndrome, the patient is able to open their eyes. Their eyes are moving, intact eye movement, and they can even communicate with their eye movements. So this is another coma, uh, coma mimic. Sometimes in catatonia, it's another coma mimic, and even psych psychogenic uh, conditions. So how can you differentiate? There are subtle signs or signs you can actually pick up in their eye, exam, or muscle tone. So they may hold their eye for forcibly. Their eye movements are intact. They may have pupils that are normal, symmetrical, unless they have used some sort of cycloplegic drug. Those eye tend to be somehow also intact, and water color testing is definitely there. Now, moving onwards to brain and brain um, stem death. Now, you might have a total or subtotal irreversible damage. And uh, in clinical practice, this may create um, basically, again, here some troubles. Uh, for the physician or, for example, a family member, that this may delay the diagnosis of brainstem when a patient has some spontaneous movements, like, for example, moving or uh, wiggling their toes or having some sort of abdominal contractions, some respiratory like movements. And these are all said to be spinal cord in origin, so from the spinal cord, not from your brain. Very interesting sign we call it the Lazarus sign, and this is an eponym, right? It's, it's named after a figure. <clears throat> so it's named after a figure 
in the biblical uh, era, basically at the time of Jesus Christ or so, uh, uh, and basically in here uh, in the Lazarus sign, uh, the patient, as you can see here, is, is a brainstem dead patient, um, and suddenly they will develop or they will adopt what we call the Egyptian mommy sign. So they will have a flexion of the wrist, flexion at the, at the elbows, and they will look like they are boxing. Uh, and this is uh, this can be can be for example misleading to the family that the patient is still awake. However, this is it's originating from the spinal cord. And lastly, is the diagnosing of brain death. Now, diagnosing of brain death um, requires actually a, a lot of experience. And as per the American Academy of Neurology, there are specific criteria that person has to go over, uh, and that includes specific prerequisites, like an, establish that there is an irreversible cause, maintain the core body temperature of the patient and see different responses. A proper neuro exam of a brainstem assessment um, itself has to be done and their absence established. And doing an apnea test is also very important. Now, brainstem death assessment in a young or in actually in children is different. And actually, I don't know if you can see it, definitely not. Uh, you can go over it if you're interested. It's, it's a different process in children as opposed to in adults. And we're going to end today's presentation by um, this technetium 99 um, scintigraphy perfusion scan. And you can see here um, on the left side, uh, this is a patient who is awake. He's, he's not dead. He's not brain dead and there is adequate perfusion as opposed to a, a, a cadaver or basically called a heart beating cadaver, a cadaver uh, on basically a machine where his heart is beating yet, but there is no cerebral perfusion. And, and basically this is differentiating or showing for you when a patient is a brain dead and, and their perfusion of the brain. And uh, that's it, thank you. I hope you enjoyed. Uh Thank you, Russia. I think you did a great job. We all enjoy it. It's a big topic. If anybody it's has any questions. Uh, Abir, Abir, what did I say? Abir, thank you, Abir. That was a great presentation. No You're welcome. Thank you, Abir. It is very fruitful. Yeah. Do you, uh, you have any, anyone has questions or we? Thank you, thank you, somewhere? Abir. Abir, do you have any obje uh, objection when we put it in, uh, uh, yeah, when we make it available for everybody to watch the video? No, 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 absolutely and I, I don't have objection. I absolutely not. Great, great. It's it's a it's a big topic, but uh, you did very well. Yeah. Thank you. You are welcome. We're looking to see you here in neurology very soon. Not um, in in two weeks, I think. Yeah, I'll be there. Hello. Inshallah, inshallah. Inshallah. Where are you now? Are you doing COVID or doing hospital? I am currently, Lala, I'm currently in emergency. I'm actually sitting in the waiting area of emergency. <laughs> okay, okay. Stay so safe. So that's my last, uh, last week. And thank you. Inshallah, inshallah. Hold. Take care. You can uh, stop recording now. <laughs> oh, yeah, I forgot. <laughs> Don't worry. Take care.